I was 19, I think, and I put a little show together. And I all screwed up and uh, but finally I got in and um, I started working and uh, Kent Hayes in uh, Johnson City that owns Jim's motorcycle shop now Ken had taught me how to ride uh, Harley's uh, foot clutch you know, hand shift and hardly anybody else in the picture business could ride those things because they, they came out with a uh, hand clutch and foot shift like I said Ken Hayes had taught me how to ride these old bikes and I could ride them and uh, then the director said, can you uh, do a wreck with that thing? I said, heck, I was doing wrecks before I was riding. <clears throat> in fact, I do wrecks good. And he said, all right, I want you to come in here and do this. And I said, all right. And I did it. And you know, one of the stunt guys said, aren't you going to put on knee pads? And I said, what are pads? I didn't know what knee pads were an elbow pads. And he helped me out. And <clears throat> I, that was where I really got got going good. I At first, when I first started, I probably worked one day every month and then a couple of days a month and you know just one thing led to another. I, when I was working uh, so little I worked uh, I parked cars on Sunset Strip that was when uh, uh, 77 Sunset Strip was big and I have a uh, shot over there uh, Ephraim Zimbalist Jr. and myself uh, I worked on the show. In fact it, everything goes around that comes around I uh, doubled Cookie Ed Burns a few times and um, later on I was directing a uh, a uh, Chips episode, and he came up for a part, and uh, I was I liked him for the part, and uh, I said, "You don't remember me, do you?" And he said, "No, Mr. Knuckles, I don't, Mr. Knuckles, right?" And uh, I said, uh, "I used to stand in and, and uh, I doubled you a couple of times." And he said, "God," he said, "I hope I was nice to you." <laughs> and I said, "Yes, you were." And, uh, but uh, I parked cars for. Uh, gosh, I don't know, several years while I was just getting started. And that all helped later when we started doing all these car chases. I could drive anything because people parking their cars at night on, 70, on Sunset Strip, it really was on Sunset Strip. It wasn't 77, but it was Sunset Strip. But I got to drive Lamborghinis and Ferraris and Lord, everything. And I met Gary Paxton. And uh, Gary and I hit it off. And, uh, and he said, have you ever tried riding? And I said, no. I, he said, you can ride and catch. And I said, sure. And he said, well, take, get a good idea. And uh, so I started writing, and uh, lo and behold, after about two weeks, I had a couple of songs published. And then all of a sudden they were recorded. And then uh, Dick Dale, you've heard of Dick Dale? Oh, yeah. Dale, so, well, he I heard a song, I wrote a song called The Scavenger. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it was like, I heard The Wanderer, and I liked that melody in The Wanderer that Dion did. And, uh, I couldn't afford a new car, or nobody could in those days. I mean, we were all, a, a guy said it in Hollywood, he said, puking off the vine. <laughs> we were just really dirt poor. And uh, I wrote this scavenger, and uh, it, it said, uh, I got a real boss car, makes all the others look sick. It's a brand new Dodge Dual Quad 426. It's got a positive traction rear and a four speed on the floor. And if you ever choose me, honey, you'll never ask for more because it's a scavenger. <laughs> and the scavenger, the scavenger was where the wanderer was, mm -hmm. you know. And uh, Gary wrote the melody, and I wrote the lyrics, and uh, that song did, really did well. And he, uh, so I bought my first really good car. I bought a, uh, it, and it was only, it's only '62 or three, whenever the wanderer came out, the early '60s. And uh, I bought this on a uh, Friday, and uh, uh, the checks came in. Uh, we got our first royalty checks, and uh, Gary Paxton gave me uh, three thousand dollars, and I went and bought a uh, '59 Ford, beautiful '59 Ford, <clears throat> and 
this on Friday, and Sunday night in front of Disney, I ran down a telephone pole. Didn't have any insurance, of course. Ran down a telephone pole and it crushed the top down and cut my head open. And <clears throat> that was the end of my car and the royalties. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> never got any more money out of that. <laughs> yeah, I got more money out of it. And uh, luckily, uh, uh, Screen Gems uh, called me and asked me if I'd write for them if I'd be under contract to Screen Gems. They gave me the princely sum of $125 a week as a as a writer. Well, you could live off of it, couldn't you? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I lived off of it. And, uh, but at the same time, you're doing stunt work also? Yeah, at the same time I was doing stunt work. How, how do you balance that? Well, it, it, you can write anywhere. That's the good yeah. thing. I could write on the set. I could have a rollover coming up, and I could sit down and write a love song. I mean, it just didn't affect me. It was like I could compartmentalize my brain or something. And uh, the real breakthrough was a thing called, and I have pictures of it, so I'll show you. There's a thing called the Grissom Gang. This other stuntman, good stuntman, his name was Roger Creed. And he had... But he had even written the gag, or the writer had written the gag, and, and but it was a perfect, perfect setup stunt. Uh, Jeff, you, the, the way it was, I mean, it had to go the way I'd put it. And I had, uh, one lucky thing, let me go back a little bit. I had always gone to school on the old stunt guys, you know. I'd say, how did you do that? How, how exactly, did, you know, with the horse, uh, and the horseback stuff, and uh, which I worked on a couple of some westerns. And... Uh, but it was a corner and it had a, a, a butcher shop in it and the, and the windows and it had two caddy corner windows like, like that. And the gag was you, these, uh, they, they were in pursuit of uh, the Grissom gang, which was, was like the uh, Dillinger gang or some of those things. And a friend of mine who played the uh, uh, Grissom. Uh, uh, Larry, uh, not Larry, Scott Wilson is his name. And so, you, lo and behold, he comes in, he hits the wall, it throws him up between the bars, he crawls across, crawls now, across the butcher shop, rolls out through the other window. Well, it looks like a piece of shit. It's just exactly what it was. It was nothing. You know, except it hurt him, of course. I mean, getting shoved up between those bars. This is the second time, the same damn thing, only this time he got hung up and he fell halfway through the first window and he couldn't crawl across and fall through the other one because he was trapped. Well, they sent him to the hospital. And George Knox said, we went over there and whispered in the director's ear, he had worked with the director, he said, you want this thing, get Knuckles. He'll guarantee it. And uh, the director said, okay, and he came to me and he said, uh, Paul, he said, uh, George says, you can do this. I said, yeah, I can do it. I said, give me one rehearsal, the steps on there, let me come in at speed and uh, just get the other guys out of the way, make them sure they're in front of me and they stay in front of me, because I'll be increasing my speed as I come in, which I figured I did, and if you say I'm going to do it at 35, I usually did it at 45, you know, because I figured the momentum has got to carry me all the way, and it did, and I hit that wall and just spit me through like a pit down a duck fast, and right through both windows and out onto the concrete on the other side and bounced and rolled and got up and took a bow and <laughs> That was that, but by the, this happened about uh, three o'clock on a Friday night, or th Saturday morning, <clears throat> on Grissom Gang, and before Monday, uh, I had uh, ten calls for jobs. You know, people, and it just went. Well, you know, I just walked away from the music thing. Chips, I, I, this is a funny story, it's a strange story. It's only in Hollywood could it happen. So I called Red, Rick Rondell and Rick said, oh, Nux, he said, well, we're not going to get it. We're not going to have a coordinator. He said, we don't think we need one. And I said, well, okay. okay. I said, I'll work it if you want. He said, okay. He said, come in and... and uh, this was Chips? So you're talking this is Chips. Okay. And... Uh, he said, come in, come in and uh, double Eric on this one thing we got Friday. got a near miss with a Cadillac coming, a drunk woman coming the wrong way on the freeway, and she's coming up the off-ramp and doing a near miss with her with the bike. I'm, I'm doubling Eric. Well, I not only do a near miss, I did, did, damn near did a complete head-on. I, uh, I hired the girl <laughs> to drive the car, and she's a, a bike rider, too. She knows how much room I need. 
especially on those big 900s. You, you have to turn here and you, you know, you'll complete it by the time you get out in the yard. So I come down the off ramp and she comes up the off ramp and I jerked over and I ricocheted off the bumper and tore the side mirror off the, off the uh, car with my windshield. And I mean, they talk about loving it. I, he said, Rick Rondell said, Jesus, no, you could do no wrong. He said, they showed that thing and the, they have dailies, you know, they go, the, the dailies can make one that come back and the next day you know, they're seeing them. And he said, they ran that thing about 10 different times. And he said, uh, what would you have to have as a coordinator? Because <laughs> then I was doing features and I was, and I liked doing features. Nobody wanted the uh, television to do because first they didn't pay enough money, they didn't want to pay any big money, and the features paid big money. And uh, but at the time, I just I didn't have a feature waiting, so I said, "How about if I do it for I think it was at the time I was fifteen hundred a week?" And he said, "That we can live with that." And I said, "Okay." So was I that, going to how does that compare to a movie? Well, a movie I probably asked for twenty five. Mm -hmm. You know, because it's uh, everything is larger naturally, you know, mm -hmm. and scale wise. This is late seventies. This is uh, yeah, seventy seven. Okay. That's when we started. Started seventy seven, ended in eighty three. Friend of mine was uh, Joy Chitwood, whose dad had started the Joy Chitwood Thrill Show. And uh, I thought, what if one night I was sitting and talking to some guys in the bar, and I said, what if we took took thr thr thrill show gags? and put them on television. It's never been done, never been tried. And I said, I'm gonna do it. And I went to the writer and I said, well then he said, all you do, he said, I'll just put in the script from page 12 to page 16, uh, chase to be uh, according to Paul Knuckles. And I'd get a car that hit another car and I, I invented a thing called a drag ramp. Put in, I put ramps behind the car and had been traffic, and then their car would run up and hit the room. Those, my, we watched that show, and, I, and my dad would always say, that would never happen in real life. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It wouldn't. <laughs> because it happened because we had ramps back there. He probably had a few wrecks, so he knew what happened when you hit a car like that. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. And uh, I'd, I'd get some cars to ski mm -hmm. on two wheels, you know. Yeah. Go around on two wheels, and then another car run into it, and then turn over and come in. But... Once you see two or three cars rolling at the same time simultaneously, well, look now, they've got 10 or 20 cars. And well, it was like a ballet of carnage sometimes. It, that's exactly what I wanted it to be. <laughs> I wanted it to be a fight on wheels. Yeah. You know, and uh, so with those with the drag ramps, and then I came out with a pipe ramp. Now, a pipe ramp, you could tow or anything, and you'd never see it. If it's going down the road and you're looking straight at it, all it is is a piece of pipe this big around, and it's got legs on it so you can latch it down. You know, but you don't see it. It's, it's your eyes can't comprehend what that is. When the, once the car gets on it, it's going to roll. I've only seen one time in my life that a car didn't. But the, uh, Phil Adams, a buddy of mine, I was just telling you about, did it on a van, and I was towing the van with a tow car, and he went up, jumped right over me, landed on all four wheels, and kept going. Wow. <laughs> and <laughs> that could happen and be a thousand to one. It happened. And you guys had at least one spectacular stunt every show, pretty much. Every show, yeah. And we, uh, and I was, I've got some pictures in there. One that almost killed me. I had invented a gag. With I had a convertible with that one, Billy Barty, the midget, mm -hmm. famous midget. And I had a, a car get on two wheels. And he was driver side high, and I was going to come in and hit underneath him on the right out of his wheel well and have him fold over on top of my car and I'd just duck into the, across the center console down into the passenger seat and we'd come to a stop with his car laying on me like a sandwich, that's what I called it. When we got ready to do it, we're doing 65, Buzz Bundy hits the, hits the, uh, no we weren't doing 65, we were probably doing 45. But Buzz Bundy hits a, a ramp I've got on another drag car over here next to the wall, which you can't see. He hits it and comes up and ski. Now he's going down the freeway on two wheels and I drive, now I'm doing 65, but I drive into him to fold him over onto me. Well what happened was my front end went into his wheel well, underneath it. And when, and it shut his car down, well when it set his car down it flipped my car. And I remember seeing the, the thing come up in the air and I'm trying to get the wheel to get it to set my car to set back down again, it's too far gone. So I just dive in and 
I always put the put the um, a dummy in there. If I'm you know if I'm doing a gag like that, I put a dummy in there and <clears throat> strap it in with the with the seat belt. I grab the seat belt and I'm pulling myself down with both hands, but boy, I see the ground coming fast. And I started hustling to get that thing, and the first thing that hit was it crushed the windshield and hit me in the head and opened my head up, of course, and down, and we were sliding. And uh, I remember I had never lost consciousness or anything, and, but my it jammed my right foot to full throttle. And the thing is going, bah! and you make the dark. The wheels were off the ground, though, weren't wheels they? Wheels were off the ground. They're all, I'm totally upside down. I got the picture there. Totally upside down, and the things run. The only thing I can move, I can move my right hand a little bit. And all, all that was on my mind, Jeff, is I've got to turn this thing off. Because stuff like that, same thing race drivers hear, is, is fire. Mm -hmm. And I know that the engine's going to dynamite any minute, it's going to explode. And when it does, I'm going to have a hell of a fire here, and I'm going to be the marshmallows. But I managed to get my hand up and get that thing off, and you wouldn't believe the, the thing. I, I felt just, oh, it's okay. And a buddy of mine stopped his car. He's driving the chase car in there. Stopped his car and run over and jerked it. I don't know how he got that door open, because it's laying right on the concrete on the freeway. And, but he got the door open. And when he did, I just backed out and... Uh, and uh, as I stood up, I don't know, it just came to me like that. I said, how'd the shot look? <laughs> <laughs> well, did you guys use that? <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, a good friend of mine, the, the guy that got me my director's card, uh, Jack Sterrett, who's dead now. Uh, Jack Sterrett was getting married, and he uh, uh, was going to have a big party, and a bachelor party. And I owned a bar right across from uh, I bought a bar somewhere and all this stuff, or, uh, my partner and I. And uh, I was across from Warner Brothers, and... Uh, uh, Larry Wilcox wanted to come to the party, and Larry could be a—he can be a jerk sometimes. And, but I said, oh, "All right." He said he really likes Stara, and he likes Stara's work, and he wanted. To. Well, about three quarters of the way through the bachelor party, uh, Larry came up and told me he was going to whip me. And I said, "You're—you you got booze talking, pal. Just forget it." And you know, he was ripped, and I was straight. And, well, about 15 minutes later, he comes over and sucker punches me in the nose. He just wanted to prove he could, I guess, oh, okay. or how tough he was, or you know, because he always played the cowboy role. I'm a cowboy, and you know, nobody can whip me. And I said outside. So we went outside, and he turned around, and I popped him one, and he slid under the car, <coughs> parked at the curb there. I waited until he got out and got up and hit him again, and underneath the car he went again about four times, and. <coughs> The next day, I drove onto the set, and I had a late call, and Eric had like a 6 o'clock call, but this is about 7.30. Late for me was 7.30 in the morning. And uh, I came and he said, don't hit me, don't hit me. He <laughs> covered his mouth, and I said, oh, come on, Eric. And he was, but uh, the funny part about it, I got a call later to go to MGM, and I thought, well, this is it. They're going to fire me, you know. Because Larry was, he was pretty bruised up. I didn't hit him, he worked in the face. And uh, uh, he had told them he fell off his horse. But the crew knew what had happened. I mean, the word gets around Hollywood just like it gets around Kingsport. You know, you can't hide something like that. And Cy Shermack called me in and he said, I understand you kicked Larry, Larry Wilcox's butt. And uh, I said, he told me he fell off his horse. And he said, well, any time he gives you any static, have it help him fall off his horse again. We, <laughs> did, we were shooting down in the barrio, down in the Puerto Rican Mexican barrio of LA, which is d downtown LA. It's down in Watts, that close to Watts. And, uh, a little dog came up to me, just teensy little dog, puppy, and it just went beside my leg, and and I said, oh God, I can't stand this. I I had four dogs at the time, <clears throat> and I couldn't. I thought I couldn't take another dog, so I t took it around, took her around the whole crew. I named her Taco. And I took around the whole crew and everybody, and everybody had a dog. And nobody wanted this little, this, she was, I, I don't know what she was, but she was part lab. She had that blue, black, shiny lab coat. And uh, I took her to Eric's trailer, and I said, come on, Pooch. I called him Pooch instead of Ponch, you know. 
I said, come on, Pooch, now you'd love to have this little dog, wouldn't you? And he said, I'd love to have it, Nux, but he said, I've got five dogs now, I can't have it. I said, no, come on, you know, we went back and forth, and he said, I'll tell you what I'll do. He said, if you'll take it home, I'll buy you a big uh, bag of dog food every single week. I said, come on, you'll buy me two sacks of dog food, and that'll be the end of that. I said, nope, I swear, I swear, God is my judge. And there's a picture of Eric right there behind you. On the, at a party at my 40th birthday. But anyway, uh, the first week there was a big 50 pound sack of dog food. And I said, okay, so I fed all my dogs. I had 50 pound sack of dog food. Second week, same thing. It went on and on and on. And there, about the 10th or 12th week, I had four or five sacks stacked up in reserve at my house. And I said, okay, Eric, you can give it a stop with the dog food. I've got plenty. Well, okay, about the 20th week, I mean, it, we're almost a full season in, and he still, every week, gives me dog food. He gave me dog food till I just flat wouldn't take it anymore, and I told him to have his driver, he had a driver, to drive to the, driving to the set, and <clears throat> I said, get that guy to do it, because I'm not going to tell you. But he, every week, the big 50-pound sacks, uh, you know, every dog I had and every coyote and Calabasas ate that food. You know, I'm saying he's just one, one good dude. He bought, when he got married, he bought tuxes for all the stuntmen for us to come and invited all the stunt guys, not just uh, the doubles for him and Larry, he bought uh, uh, just the guys that worked on the show all the time. You use the guys from the stunt show where you got the idea to, to do your stunts? Sometimes. I use yeah. Joy all the time, but I did most of them. I did, uh, it, it, I took one roll over a week, but I had, I had a sweet, sweet deal. It's, it's sort of like having the, the, the inmates run the asylum. You know, I wrote the gags and then did the gags, you know, and, uh, and, and directed the gags the way they were done. So they kind of shot the story around your stunt that you came up with that week. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd come up with a, a gag, a new gag, and uh, Cy Shermack, would, he would come into the set, he was funny, he told me one time, he said, I know you're going to kill yourself, he said, but I'm not going to watch it. And But it's okay seeing it in dailies, you know, because he knew then I was okay, and I'd walked away from it. And then Eric got hurt, and uh, they didn't expect that, you know, when Eric almost got it. Eric loved the way we'd come in with the motorcycles, and we'd do brake slides. You know, we'd whip the handlebars this way and get on the rear brake and stay on it and slide up and with your feet still on the pegs. And just, while it's still slide, you put the kickstand down and just drop it over on the kickstand. Eric loved that look, you know, because it proved how, how what good a rider you were. And I had backed the car up through a telephone pole and the car fell on the, on the uh, sort of like that did when it really happened to me, only I wasn't backing up and I hit that. But this one was on film. But anyway, they were both trapped in the car, and uh, supposedly Larry and Ponch and John come up and uh, get them out and get the, the, the electric wires are popping and all this. And, well, Eric's going to do a brake slide into that, but what he did, and I told him a hundred times, don't let off that brake, because once you let off, it's going to high side. Okay. Your high side is when, you, when you're sliding like that, and you let off the brake, and it, the wheel will catch. When it catches, it pitches yeah. it. But, well, what it did is it pitched Eric off, and it pitched him with his his back hit to, between the uh, grill and the hood, and as his back hit, that 1,200-pound bike came in on him, Ooh. and it ruptured the aorta in his heart. Dang. And it, he came in an ace of dying. And, he, and if they hadn't got him to UCLA Medical Center, they airlifted him in there. If they hadn't got him in there, he would have died right there on the spot. And I, I went to see him in the hospital, and he said, don't say it. You told me so. <laughs> Did it take him a while to get, get recovered from that? Yeah, it took him about uh, two or three months, but he was back at work pretty quick. Uh, I was just trying to remember if he, I don't think he rode a bike. See, we had a bike trailer that we could put them on, and we could move them back and forth. You know, and they'd just ride and be pulled by a pickup. Right. You know, and uh, that was good. I can't remember how long he was out, but he was back fairly quick, though. We, we went six years, and we were supposed to be picked up for the seventh, and somehow somebody yanked it, and 
figured they'd made a mistake, but everybody was wrong by then. But you know, in, in uh, uh, the motion picture industry, you can uh, you can work with people and get to like we get, we get to be friends today. I may not see you for 20 or 30 years. It's just that's just the nature of the business. Uh, like Dick Warlock and I worked on Rap Patrol, and then we didn't see each other for several years. And uh, then we get together and play frisbee. And uh, I said sooner or later they'll have frisbee Olympics. And I think they're getting close to it. <laughs> <clears throat> but uh, it's a business that's, that's strange in that way. You meet people and get to know them and get to really like them, and then you don't see them for a while. Or you go on a location, and they used to call it location romances. Uh, that always happened. Somebody would somebody would leave with somebody's wife or somebody's husband. Or, uh, like we thought we for sure we're going back. So when we had the rap party for Chips, everybody said, "See you next season. See you next season." It was like uh, I think we wrapped in uh, February or something, and, and we, uh, we were talking March to start ahead. You know, it's like uh, I have a thing there from Miami Vice. Their production managers let me know when to come back to work on Miami Vice, but. I was only off two or three weeks, and I and I worked on shows that were in town, you know, then. And like I said, then I did that cutter to Houston, and and then segued right into Miami Vice. Eric said one time, on, I think he said on Johnny Carson or something. He said the the biggest thing about he said the two things about Chips. He said are my smile and Knuckles Rex. Yeah. And he and you know and he was right. Mm -hmm. Because uh, I would uh, call Chip and say, come and stay with me and help me. I'm tr trying to get this new gag worked out, and Chitwood would say, "Well, this might work, or that might work." And uh, <clears throat> and I took all the, I took a whole thrill show and just encapsulated it, a record of time for that, you know. And features, they give you a week to set up a rollover. I don't know what those guys are doing, jacking or what what they're doing, but it, it takes takes about, well, take a good rollover, you can take a day, uh, or half a day. If you've already got the roll cage in, or you're, you don't need to use the roll cage, if you get a car with a post in, well, you know the cars like all the old cars between the back and the front four doors, they have a post in there that's the roof, that, that will keep the roof from crushing in if, if you know in a rollover. And uh, I just used those kind of gags and invented gags of my own, and you know, and then I tell you, I could do. Uh, uh, I'd love to do those multi. We did a. Uh, a show called Mate Team one time, but really let me go what I wanted to do. Multiple Accident Investigation Team is what it stands for. And Bonnie, the the girl, uh, Highway Patrol girl, she used to, funny enough, she used to go with Joe Namath. She was Joe Namath's main squeeze when we were doing uh, CC and Company. But, uh, uh, where was I? Uh, oh, she, she supposedly, she uh, comes up to this, she gets involved in wreck, and they think she caused it. She said, something blinded me. And they're building a subdivision, this is script in the script. They're building a subdivision on top of the hill, and this truck that carries the windows, people's picture windows, it gets in just the right spot that, that the sun hits it, and the rays hit her in the eye, and she gets, she turns it, turns the wrong way and turns onto the wrong side of the road and causes this multiple accident investigation wreck. That 12 people get killed. We didn't kill any people in five, six years, and all of a sudden we killed 12 in one, <laughs> one fell swoop. But they asked me how to do it, and I said, okay, we'll have this car come here, and this car will go under that and rip the roof off. And, you know, we did that, and we could do a car tearing the roof off in a couple hours. I just set my cameras and doing the lead ups, you know, then saw the roof a little bit and drive her under there, you know. Mm -hmm. and, uh, People are doing features saying Knuckles going to kill somebody one of these days. The <laughs> closest one I ever owned came to killing was myself. Yeah. Right? <laughs> well, uh, so when it, when Chips ended, was there kind of a, a, a letdown, a little bit depressing? It was a big letdown, but I, uh, uh, funny, they canceled it and, uh, one week, and the next week I had a, a series called Cutter to Houston. You probably never heard of it or saw it. But it was a uh, medical show really and uh, did that and then I got a call from a guy that uh, brought me to New York the first time I went to New York to double Travolta on uh, Saturday Night Fever 
a guy named John Nicolella, who turned out to be another mentor of mine. But Jack Sturrett was the first one. I'll tell you Jack Sturrett story in a minute. But uh, so he called and said uh, he was uh, had a, a pilot that going to Miami, and it's called Gold Coast. And would I be interested? And I said, sure, I'd love to go to Miami. <clears throat> so they said they came up with my money, and, and uh, next stop we're in, we're in Miami. <laughs> but uh, but it was it became a national phenomenon. Now, just like chips, you were in one national phenomenon right after another. How does that how did that just happen? Just pure blind luck. Yeah. I wish I could say it was choice, but yeah. I just took the first job that came along. Really? Yeah. And you uh, you said you used the uh, the stunt show gags and kind of built up around your stuff on chips around that. How did you do Miami Vice? Because now you got boats and. All kinds of different. Uh, you had to play Miami Vice. You couldn't hook it at all. Yeah. You know, you just uh, what I do is is and a lot of people will under, will will you know put speed on the camera. You know, instead of instead of sh shooting it at 24 frames, I shoot it. So you're not going as fast in real life. You're not going as fast as it looks on the camera. Right. So you're cranking it up some. And but I use real speed in that. And one one episode I remember they had me driving a a uh, Lamborghini Countach and we were on the interstate and I was running it up to 180 miles an hour sometimes on the interstate with a crew with that we had a Corvette it was a Corvette Ferrari is what it was it was a Ferrari Daytona body and Corvette motor and that thing would haul the mail and we, we'd sometimes get in with real was that was that the car that they're supposed to be driving there yeah the black one okay you know and we had a long discussion I had a long discussion with Michael Mann who give me anything I wanted. I mean, they just gave me carte blanche on that show. And, uh, but uh, hell, I felt like a vampire. I didn't see the sun for months. You know, I've worked all night. And uh, you can save a lot of money because you don't do anything. You know, you don't go anywhere. You eat right on the set. You go home and sleep and come back to the set. You know, they have a, uh, a hitman, a Colombian hitman that dresses as a woman. And does a complete thing, with, but she's in high heels. And, and we, I had J N Dublin woman, and I had to, we went down to the shoe store <laughs> to find some shoes for him. And we started started cracking up, and we started. And the, the, first of all, the lady said, uh, "Who who are these?" We do, I said, "Want some some high heels shoes?" So who are these women? Well, they're for him. The lady said, "Really? <laughs> you know, we're trying to explain. Listen, we're straight. We're we're just getting these for Miami Vice." <laughs> she said, "Sure." <laughs> you know, and one thing led to another, and <laughs> pretty soon we're just cracking up. You know how you get on a laughing jag? You just can't get away from it. And he can't walk in these damn shoes. I mean, it's just impossible. <laughs> His feet keep turning funny ways. He just about sprained an ankle in them. By the time we got out there. We'd pick some shoes that had heels on them like this, and I said, Dirk, we're going to have to shoot around these damn shoes because, you know, there's no way he can run in those things. And finally, I think, he finally he's chasing somebody in, in the thing, and he, he's got the gun down in his bodice. He pulls his pistol out <coughs> and, and grabs the shoes with the other end, and he's running and firing and carrying them damn shoes. And I tell you what, it was one of the funniest things I've, I've ever had happen to me because neither one of us could, could really explain to, to a woman that don't know anything about motion pictures why you're dressing a guy up and who's got, now, I've, got him, I've got his dress on him and his wig <coughs> and explain those shoes. <coughs> but DJ, he was a different game altogether. He was hard to get along with at times and, and so I guess we all are. But he he saw that as his one big way to make it. He told me about all his problems with alcohol and you know he uh, he uh, had uh, alcohol poisoning a couple of times and burned or died. Uh, and he Melanie he went with uh, he went with Melanie when she was I think like 14. And mm -hmm. uh, he married her when she was 16 I guess or 17. You know, Melanie Griffith. Right. And, uh, and that, they were kind of having a turbulent time during that show, weren't they? they? They were together and off and on and could never tell, you know. Just <clears throat> but, you know, what we did was to, uh, we couldn't do the wrecks that we did on chips. 
although I did get a few wrecks in there. I got I got a good cannon roll in, and I got uh, I got a thing <coughs> that you would have liked. There was there was a building down there, and it shows a road on it, and it's painted. The road's painted on the side of the building. Well, I took a a pipe ramp and uh, had a Corvette and put the pipe ramp just prior to getting say this is the building. And he hits the pipe ramp and goes, and I, and I, when I set my pipe ramp, I'd have him driving on that road that was mm. up there. And it, I got phone calls, and Sam said, she said, I've watched your show, and I love your show. You've got to tell me how you drove on that building. <laughs> and it wasn't. And that car never touched the building. Uh -huh. it, just, it was from me to you from the building, but my camera was back here. Uh -huh. So it just showed it going all the way Was it there. flying through the air, or was it like on rail? It was flying through the air. Huh. And but the uh, the ramp is here, and he hits the ramp straight. He's hitting the ramp straight. Mm -hmm. But once he's in the air, and, and they're shooting background, he's on that road. I mean, you would swear to God he was on that road. I would have sworn he was on it. No, I thought it's going to be big when we got when we when our pilot, uh, you know, and everybody wants the pilot and because the old coast at that time, and they changed it to my advice. Uh, we were number two, and it was ratings week, and we were number two, and number one was Cosby. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, by comedy show, I ain't worried about that. What's the next action show? That's, you know, and the next action show was like 15th or something. Mm -hmm. So I figured, yeah, we got a lot, and I figured we are going to be good for five to seven years. But five, I was ready to quit. Really? You know, I, well, my knees were bad, my shoulder was bad, my back was bad, you know. Uh, <clears throat> what, what were the years of that show? 85, 84 through, let's see, 83, 80, 84 through 92, five years. You, you ran the whole gambit of the series? Yeah, well, except for the last two or three shows. I'd quit, come home to Tennessee, and then they called me with a with another pilot called Thunderbolt Row. And, you know, since I'd done Vice and you knew all the boats and the Thunderbolts and all that stuff, plus a... Uh, I have a guy, a, I know another name I'm going to forget, uh, but anyway, he's the guy that designed and built the cigarette boats, the drug boats. Mm -hmm. Now the government comes to him and said, build me an interdiction boat, and he built an interdiction boat that would catch the, the cigarette boats and outrun them. And the, 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 now this is real life or this is this the plot? This is real. Okay. Uh, and so he drives his Mercedes, and, he, and there is a place called Thunderbolt Row. It's a street there in Miami Beach, mm -hmm. in Miami. And he drove his Mercedes down to the, the stop line and stopped, and uh, they had, I guess, two to three Mac 10s. Oh, they oh, were like out. Oh, boy. Yeah. So that's what this, was that the premise of the series? That was the premise of the series, that, that what Thunderbolt Row was. And, uh -huh. and this was going to be, he's already dead, in the, or maybe... You know, we, we, I think we shot his getting killed in the in the flashbacks, mm -hmm. and then uh, who was in that? Uh, in Thunderbolt Row. Yeah. Chad Everett, if you remember him from years ago. Oh yeah, he just I recently mean, passed away too. Yeah, Chad Everett. I can't think of who the girls were. Yeah, the co-leads. You know. They didn't have any young guys. Any yeah, they had some young guys like uh, like the guys that are on the Y Five O. Uh. -huh. uh there were guys like that, but they were second leads. Chad Everett yeah. was the what's the he thing? Was the that, honcho. Yeah, he's like the guy that's on NC. Uh, uh, Jethro. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, that I never heard of it, so that must not have lasted very long. Uh, one run, thank God. One season. <laughs> one one run. The pilot. Oh, just the pilot. Okay. <laughs> yeah. We never made anything else. Well, I was. I had to. So they made me sign a contract that I would do the series if it got picked up. So I was just praying it didn't get picked up. Because mm -hmm. you know? <clears throat> I had so much second unit stuff to do on that. I had a lot of helicopter stuff. And I love helicopter stuff. And uh, We went out in the glaze and we shot some stuff you'd love, Jeff. I, we, I put a camera in the, in the nose of the chopper. And I rode in the chopper with the pilot, just me and the pilot. But I had him come down and get about a foot maybe off the sawgrass at 120. Wow. And the and chopper's crabbing like that. And yeah. Then, boy, did I tell you what, the footage, the guy said like the first footage on Bullet, it actually make you sick to your stomach. Mm. Yeah. I did another film while I was doing the in-between called Scorchy with, uh, with Connie Stevens. And I did, did, did Seattle. We had to shoot it in Seattle. And I used Seattle like San Francisco over and down mm. the hills and there, you know, hubcaps flying off. And, 
You know, my producer one time told me, he said, Paul, just one thing. He said, please don't take those damn rear view mirrors off anymore. Because every time I, if you're getting ready to roll a car, yank that rear view mirror off. The windshield was just the first thing that hits you in the head. Is that rear view mirror sticking up? I just mm -hmm. throw it in the back seat. Uh, John Nicolella, the guy I said that was my, is my a mentor of mine, who hired me on uh, Saturday Night Fever <coughs> to, to double Travolta. And that was a, that was a pick, and they wanted somebody that could do it with, because uh, we shot at night with uh, on Saturday Night Fever with uh, with those kids out on the, we were on the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. And at night, that thing, it is spooky. When you're up high in the thing and shooting it, and, and Nicolella said that he wanted somebody that's not going to uh, buck and run and try to and not get those kids on there because every time they got on that bridge, I had them wired. You know, so if they fell, they fell. They're only going to fall a few feet. You know? and I had to do that because if one of those, that, because they get into those parts, especially the younger or the better, and they got screaming and yelling and after this girl and. Everything, and I thought, boy, one of them's going to make a bad mistake and fall off this bridge, and then there, there goes my career. There was two ma pretty major scenes on the bridge, right? There was the first one where, where he pretends like he falls. Yeah. And then the second one where the we kid were, actually does fall. Yeah, yeah. And we shot it on uh, two different nights. I had a stunt double there for him. Then we had a... a, 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 a was it... Fight in the, remind me, was it Travolta's character that is actually kind of doing the... The dangerous stunt, stunt at the beginning, uh, in the first one before. No, that was the uh, the other kid. Uh, I can't think of his name. But, uh, Travolta really kind of didn't have too much to do in that. You know, he just made, mainly stayed in the car and said, "You people are crazy." Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was the others. But uh, the big shot I had with Travolta in, in starting up here was uh, the clubhouse fight. When they get to fight in the clubhouse, then I had to double drive the car, and I jumped on the side of the car and let him pull me back out through and headed down the street with me. He takes off down the street with me, and then I let go and roll over. The the person that they're fighting, you played you played both parts then. Yeah, you were the the fighter and the and the person from the clubhouse too. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, <laughs> and because I was the only one I had, I had the, my double driving the car, mm -hmm. so I was hanging on the side. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's gosh, that's one of the most memorable scenes in Hollywood history, right there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I never thought about it that way. <laughs> well, there, there's a lot of scenes like that from that movie. Of course, you weren't you weren't on the dance floor, though, were you? No, no, I didn't get on the dance floor. Travolta's too darn good. <laughs> he was he was a nice guy. I tell you what, we started Chips right after Saturday Night. Um, <clears throat> so. I guess you came around full circle after after that one series didn't get picked up. You retired and moved back to Johnson City, or yeah, moved back to the area. Yeah. Well, I tell you, I, 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 what I thought at the time, I thought I was coming home to die. I have never really been so physically, mentally wore to a frazzle. You know, from overwork. From overwork and all those hours, and, uh, and the money was just uh, uh, you know just rolling in. I mean, I I've never made so much money in one time in my life. I mean, I'd have to, I'd go from one, we'd be shooting two episodes at one time. And I couldn't, I didn't want to have anybody do, try to do what I was telling them to do. I knew they'd screw it up somehow. But I, I remember one time, I was, I worked all night on the episode we were shooting on. And Don Johnson was going to uh, direct the, the following episode. And he said, next I want a road. Now he called me into the said just before the company wrapped and everybody went home to bed, everybody except me, of course. He said, I want you to build me a, a good camera road all the way around uh, where the, where the uh, Miami River comes out into Biscayne Bay on the other side. He wanted a camera road around there so he could follow this speedboat that's coming on plane now, which means it's hauling buggy. And uh, then that, that is now just a... Uh, just a big field out there. He said, I want a good camera ready road all the way around there. And he said, I want you to be done with it. This is like a Monday night. I want you to be done with it by Wednesday. I said, Jesus Christ, Don, can't you push back and, and uh, shoot something else? I mean, we've got plenty of stuff to shoot while I get some 
get that road built. No, I go, my God, I want that road and I want it by two days from then. I said, all right, and I called Don Gold, woke him up, the production manager. I said, DJ wants this damn road built. And I said, he said, I got people standing by you calling. And I said, he said, I'll meet you out there. Well, it's six o'clock now. And I didn't even have time to have breakfast because we were shooting outside of Miami a little bit. And I come back, <clears throat> I wait out there, I sit in my truck. Finally, they ain't showed up by 6 37 o'clock. I go to sleep in my truck, and 11 o'clock, somebody wakes me up, pulling my foot. Well, it could have been. Could have been a mad Colombian wanting to kill me, but luckily it was a contractor. And I said, I need a road bill around, and I take him through the whole thing. He said, no, Saturday or Sunday's quickest. I said, get more equipment in here. He said, start one crew at that end, and one crew at that end, and have them meet in the middle. You know. What, what were they going to make the road out of? They have to make it out of dirt. We didn't pave it, but we had, it could have been paved. It was smooth as silk. Just I mean, kind of yeah, like well, red, he red. Want, What DJ didn't want, he's on that camera car and riding, coming in. He wants to be as smooth as that speedboat is. Speedboat's going, you know how they are when they come up on planes and just, and he wants to be coming with this, at this, this is the insert car right here, and going like that and into the Miami River. The shot's probably, um, Oh, maybe a minute and a half, two minutes long. It's a sighting shot. I mean, you see all of Miami Beach in the background, all the hotels and everything. And, um, but it cost, God almighty, I bet that road cost over $100,000. We've got all the two contractors with all their uh, dozers and whatever else they use, road graders. And, but it was ready when DJ Wonder ready, you know. Did and I still ain't been to bed yet. Did he use it? Yeah. <laughs> okay. At least, yeah, he didn't, didn't at least he didn't decide not to use it. <laughs> yeah, well, that, I've had that happen. <laughs> but anything he wanted, and they didn't care how much. It, we were spending, well, like on on uh, chips, we were spending five hundred to seven fifty thousand per per episode. Sometimes we never went a million dollars. Well, on a two parter maybe, but. My advice, we were spending a million, million and a half like there was nothing. You know? Well, they were paying overtime on everybody that's just, you know, you just say, how can they do this? You know? I, I guess somebody was paying some money for some commercials. Those, the, like the people on the Super Bowl. Yeah. They, you know, which is, it's, it's great, it's commercial, and it's funny for about five minutes. Then you forgot. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that show was the most popular show on TV for a long time. Yeah. And I tell you, uh, that uh, Don uh, Johnson said one time, he said, the thing about it, he said, I don't mind paying anything to you, Nux, because your stuff is on film. Mine's all in front of the camera. It's not behind it. You know? <coughs> right, those, those Ferraris, I took those Ferraris out one night, and I was, I was shooting a stock footage of what I was doing. And I told them, I said, I wanna, when I was riding, racing motorcycles, I had a skid plate on the bottom of it. When I hit big rocks and things, it wouldn't come up and bust my cases. So. Mm -hmm. Well, it put out a lot of sparks, so I had one to put on the Ferrari just to see. And I had uh, Ernie driving, uh, Ernie was in Dublin, Philip Michael Thomas, the black guy. And he was <clears throat> driving this one time, and they had him go over this bump. And that, it spread sparks all the way down the street. Well, I used that every time I was out with those cars. I'd get the mm -hmm. hit, and, and people would call in and say, that, boy, that looks good. You know you're going fast. You see all those sparks. Hit. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, when uh, when the show ended, what did uh, you, you came back home? Did you just kind of take a big rest? Or? I just took a big rest and healed up. Yeah. Yeah. Have you had a lot of injuries, the plaguing injuries over yeah, the years? Yeah, uh, plaguing injuries that, that possibly should have been operated on, but I wouldn't go for surgery, like on my knees. I wouldn't go on my hips. You know, <clears throat> my back was all screwed up and still is. <clears throat> but I'm. 100% better than I was when I when we first wrapped up that. Mm -hmm. how, how long have you been retired? Since, uh, well, I say probably since the Dolly Parton thing, but I did, hadn't really retired because I still go back and do commercials every now and then. Mm -hmm. And uh, two Super Bowls ago, I had a uh, had a commercial that uh, ran and just paid like a slot machine. Those commercials are pure gold. You know, I've got some buddies in LA that don't do anything for commercial. Mm -hmm. I make a darn good living. Yeah. I was I got paid and I think I made thirty thousand dollars in thirty minutes. Huh. 
just an unbelievable. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds like a good job. Yeah, it was a good job. I mean, I went to the set. The set was downtown L.A. And <coughs> I came came in at uh, 6 o'clock in the morning and actually uh, went to work at like 9. By 9.30 I was done and on the way mm. back back to the hotel so I could come back to the Tennessee. So you're, you're kind of still active. Oh, yeah. Yeah, like that thing I showed you, I, I put some stuff. Yeah. yeah. Directing... Directing, I'd, I'd go back to directing in the heartbeat. Yeah. Yeah. But I couldn't want to be hitting the ground anymore like I used to. Yeah. Those days are done. Well, if I did my math right, uh, were you, are you just kind of around 70 or so right now? 73. 73, okay. Yeah. Well, you you seem, even, even though you had all the body damage, you're doing pretty good for 75, 73, seems well, like. That, don't I have a couple of years on there? Don't, don't <laughs> knock. I don't want to jinx yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, well, today, the motorcycles keep me young, mm -hmm. you know, I get, uh, but I will not ride them when it's freezing as cold, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. So you've been cooped up for a while, then I tell you. Yeah, yeah. I get, get cabin fever. <laughs> <laughs> have you heard anything from Hollywood lately? They want, Have you got anything lined up? Nothing lined up, no, and, and uh, a buddy of mine, William Smith, the guy that said the that picture right there. Yeah, I'm, I know who that is. Yeah, you know William? Yeah, I know who he, who he is. Okay. Yeah. He, I'm, I'm familiar with his work. Okay, yeah. Uh, Bill, I did a lot of pictures with him, doubled him a lot of pictures. Yeah. And uh, not with his arms out there. He's got ham off yeah. the arms. But uh, he, I just got a call. He's in uh, the motion picture home now. His wife had to put him in there. Oh, no. Yeah, he has dementia real bad. Mm. He, uh, he, got, he was kind of, he was not, not a spring chicken in that movie. He's No, he's close to my age. Yeah. Uh, he uh, last time I was out there, we all belonged to a uh, club called the Hollywood Mafia. I don't know if you saw that mm -hmm. sign over there, but uh, it, none of us are mafia or, or, or just just a joke. Yeah, I know. I, I, but uh, Bill, uh, about five or six times, we'd be talking, and then he'd say, "Now, notice where'd you say you was living again?" I said,